I'm in the woods here at our main six acre nursery site in Trumansburg, New York today on a clear but ice cold winter day, making some observations and doing a little bit of work here or there. And I thought what I'd like to do in this video is share notes around specifically uh, our ash canopy. You can see some of the taller, these are some of the nicer, taller ones we have in our landscape that are beginning to succumb to emerald ash borer. And looking at this through, let's call it a permaculture lens or just um, some alternative strategies to the picture that we're given or the management structure that we're normally offered in this situation. If you're interested in learning more in depth about the emerald ash borer, what it does to ash trees, etc., definitely search online. There's tons of information out there, but I'm just going to give the very brief synopsis, which is uh, as we start to see more and more little pale areas form on these ash trees. It is called blonding, from what I understand of it. It is uh, the expression of these tiny little creatures that are eating the uh, underneath the bark of the ash, and the bark is being pecked off by birds in the pursuit of trying to find those little creatures. In big swatches of the United States, it is truly fatal. Uh, and there are many places where ash are more or less completely decimated, and it's starting to happen here. So what should I do about it? The two dominant strategies that I've been exposed to over and over again, which I am not doing, is the first one is to say, well, emerald ash borer is coming in. Let's go ahead and cut all the ash trees down. And okay, if you're under very intense financial pressure that you need lumber value from those trees, maybe that's a driver, that's up to you. But that doesn't appeal to me fundamentally. Another idea is, well, it's a pest, it's, it's a bad thing, it's an invasive, we should use chemicals. And of course, there are options to use pharmaceuticals or chemicals on these trees. You can inject them with poison that moves through the trees and kills the emerald ash borer. Uh, it's expensive and it's gross seeming to me. Maybe you have one perfectly beautiful ash and that's it on your entire property and you're starting to see little hints. Maybe that's something to think about, but I can't, I'm not sold on that at all. So then what can I do about it? Well, it's subtle in some ways, and it's maybe easy to overlook, but in between each of these ash, so these are the larger stems here, knowing that emerald ash borer was pr pretty darn likely, if not inevitable, coming to our area, back in 2009, I did some research and tried to find some plants that can grow under the canopy of an ash, get themselves established, and then if we have emerald ash borer, the additional light and resources that would become liberated to the forest floor would be available to them. If we didn't, and the ash stayed and continued to grow into old age, it would still be compatible and we get some production. So let me show you some of those characters. So there's an ash with the telltale signs of the boar doing their work. It'll be a sad day when these trees finally pass away, but the flip side of that is that what once were tiny, tiny little hazelnuts you can hear the crunch of the snow underneath me. Sorry about that. This is a shrub of hazel. There's a whole bunch in here. I planted about six or seven under the shade of the ash. And there, these are a little bit smaller than some of the hazels that we planted out in fuller sun, but they've made nuts a little bit here or there. And I'll tell you, they are waiting their turn to get into the canopy. I think once the, the ash do not leaf out at all, and all of that light and resource is going to be liberated to them, they'll come into some seriously productive times. It's pretty amazing to see that with the amount of light competition or struggle that they'd have, they've had to put up with, some of these hazels go up 15, 20 feet, little spindly whips with tons and tons of catkins way, way up high. I barely get a single nut from those up there. The squirrels get them all, but that's fine. Once the canopy opens up, the shoots that come from the ground will be a little bit sturdier and trend towards being a little bit more low and stout and more available to us. But scrawny and leaning for now, no, they haven't died. It's been 10 years. They're just waiting their turn to get up into that canopy. Another character in here that's working quite nicely is the pawpaw. They're that beautiful form right in front of me. Uh, last year, this, this tree made its first set of fruit. It took quite a while, but it did it. And pawpaw is a really great example of a tree that tend to naturally form in understories anyway and really enjoy once they get to be about this age. This is a nice mature, you know, 12 some odd year old pawpaw. 
If they were to get a whole lot more light, they'd be able to be a lot more productive. And you can see the winter sun going through right there. The summer sun uh, over this pawpaw is completely blocked by ash in the late day. Now this pawpaw would have been under a lot of stress if it was planted in a clear cut. If I had just basically cut every single ash and tried to plant in pawpaws, they would have suffered. But they did just fine in the understory. And when that light release comes, they'll become even more productive. Here's a beautiful plant, the Coosa dogwood or Cornus Coosa. Dogwood in general is just a great candidate for an understory, even if there is no light release. They, they form up beautifully, they make fruit nicely, uh, beautiful flowers. And so there's one here, there's a pollinator partner over here. There's some service berries in here. We planted some raspberries and some black currants and some pink currants. They did pretty nicely. Elderberry, not so happy with the shade, but it's been holding on. This is a York that's been here for 10 years and they're starting to die out because they're not getting enough light. So um, the ash release will actually be very, very helpful. I'm gonna leave this plant here. They may die before the ash release enough light, but it'll be interesting to see if that timing is compatible. Hopefully I'm conveying the point I'm trying to make here, which is not at all to say, oh, if you see an issue in your landscape, you should truly do nothing, no intervention, do absolutely nothing. But I think there's some extreme value in saying, well, if some sort of ennui or disease or herbivory or some sort of pressure, perceived pressure is starting to happen on a given species or a given region of a property, what are the ways that we can add some diversity into that, some different options, some different pathways that succession can happen that can give us a number of different yields. So if inevitably those trees die or senesce or reduce or disappear, there'll be at least a few other species that can replace them maybe full canopy trees, maybe subshrubs, maybe shrubs, but diversity in all the ways. Background, are they from this continent, are they not? How can they work here? We're moving into a very different climactic picture and I think the more variety we try uh, without being destructive or aggressive or chemically driven as part of the solution, the more opportunities and more pathways things can take. So in just this one stand of ash, We've got the hazelnuts, the pawpaws, the coosa dogwood, the currants, the elderberry, there's some honeyberry, but there's also some chestnuts and oaks. They're leaning pretty hard. Those would be the ultimate long-term canopy replacing trees. You can see there's a chestnut right here in front of me. There's an oak with their leaves still on them right here. But at least 10 different types of beings that can come into their own if and when the ash pass away. And we can take a step back and let that arc happen how it's going to. We don't have to bite our fingernails and we don't have to rush in to figure out what's next uh, once they die. I'm not by any stretch here giving some particular prescription. You must plant hazelnut under an ash tree, but more pattern language and just a lens to look through. So to zoom out, and look at some different options. For example, this is a row of Scott's pine in front of me, and that weighs south, this weighs north. And I've been watching over the last many years. Each year, more and more branches die. They're just not, they're not in it for the long haul. I don't think it's a disease. I don't think it's fungal or, you know, some gnarly thing that's happening. I just think they're inappropriate for this landscape. But again, that same pattern of, I don't want to kill them just because I don't think they're great for being here but who could be next? And so in between each of these Scots pine, just to the south, I added in Carpathian walnut, Juglis, uh, Juglans regia. Now this is a six year old tree. That seems pathetic. Oh my God, it's only that tall for six years. Well, it's there, it's alive. It's been kind of sitting, uh, it's, they're struggling, but they're here. There's another tiny, tiny, and another teenser right there. But they haven't died. Each year they put on a little bit more growth. And when these Scots pine finally just don't leaf out and completely die back, uh, they'll take off like crazy. They'll be able to absorb all the extra nutrients from the roots dying off, all that extra light. And they'll have had many years of developing a robust root system. Even though their tops aren't huge, they'll be able to replace this canopy. And my gosh, a whole laneway of easy to crack walnuts in the future would be quite beautiful and I'd have six less years of having to wait for it because of the work I'm doing now. I shared notes recently about our 
wonderful friend, the American persimmon. You can see one right in front of me. Here we are in mid-February and there's still little fruits hanging on there. But the reason I want to bring your attention to this particular spot is back in 2009, this had lots and lots of ash trees in this area. This was very ash dominant. And so in this case, I actually cut a fair number of the ash down because I needed somewhere to plant some more trees. Those ash became firewood. Some of them were harvested for poles to make rafters for small outbuildings. Some of them were woven into a brush wall. Some were turned into charcoal. We planted these persimmons. Now, persimmons are doing really well. This one in particular is just a beautiful, beautiful friend doing great work. And what's interesting is there are a few ash in here that I simply left because they were on the edge. They weren't in the way of the work I'm trying to do. And I think this is a great example. Here is an ash tree right in front of me that I had thought about cutting down, but I chose not to. And over the last few years, it died. I can't say exactly why. Was it emerald ash borer? I'm not sure, but it just died and I've left it. And what's happened now is that when birds come in to collect persimmon or to hunt or to look for things, they can land on this snag, this dead ash tree, and the root systems are fully available to these persimmons to absorb and build themselves. Eventually the ash will give way and fall over. Uh, will it crush a persimmon? It's possible. Will it just kind of dissolve? That's more probable. Um, but because these are not incredibly precious grafted trees, these are seedlings, if they get a big set of branches cracked off them, I can just cut and clean that up. If they get just crushed to the ground, I can cut them to the ground and they'll coppice and spread and sucker. Pawpaw does a great job of that. Persimmons under stress will spread and thicket form. So I'm not worried about this tree crushing them and setting me back a bunch of years. But there it is, it's a successional change. And in fact, this uh, persimmon now to the south, living incredibly vibrant life, tons of seed load in those uh, fruits that can move into new places and almost taller than that skeleton of the ash to the north of them. And my gosh, is it insane how much deer the, <laughs> these persimmons draw in. Look at this pathway with the snow you can see. That's all just deer traffic. There's little poops every two inches right through here. And these are bedding spots. There's at least three or four places where deer have been sleeping in here and it's, they're sleeping and using the bathroom under here. It's fertilizing this white pine immensely. In some areas on the far west end of the property where I want a lot more light so we can create some very diverse orchards, kind of split the difference between leaving ash entirely to grow and die from the boar or cutting them down to kill them and did some pollarding work. So this was a few years ago. You can see where I cut the tree during the dormant season. This is all new growth that is above the brows of deer. Will this be immune to emerald ash borer? Probably not, but it's very young, very vigorous wood, and it's possible that maybe it gives them a little bit longer of a time before the borer can settle in. Maybe there's an opportunity for them to get to a bearing age of setting seed to cast a new genetic pathway. Maybe there's some novel new types of ash that can come from this uh, that will be able to coexist with the ash borer. I don't know, but you can see some other ash in here that just recently I cut at four or five feet, six or seven feet so that they can regrow in the spring, cast a little bit of shade, but not as much as they were before. And we can move this into an orchard while having regrowth of ash for some shade, some privacy, and an opportunity to let them regrow into full size if we choose to. But more likely than not, it'll be to harvest pole wood every five to 10 years. Just another pathway to think about. It looks super wacky and crazy, but in some ways it's actually quite structural and beautiful. And that amount of canopy release is gonna be crazy stimulating to whoever comes in here next to the north of that spot. Here's a little bit of a wacky example, but just more potential creative pathways to consider for the inevitability of borer in our future with ash. Is here's an ash tree that I cut when dormant in the fall at about that height eight feet, seven feet. And so all of these new shoots are in the last year, last two years of growth. So tons of vigorous regrowth, really strong expression of borer happening here. 
so it probably will succumb. But in the meantime, the part that was cut, I made a little recess with an electric chainsaw, strapped it on, and then used other poles of ash from the woods and some very simple lashing and structure to make a trellis that may give us uh, some support for vining crops for the next five, 10, maybe 15 years. Grow some beautiful winter squash on this from rearranging the ash bodies that were in the woods and the main load being born on an ash tree that's actually still alive. Be interesting to see what comes of this. There are lots and lots more examples of this kind of theme happening in this woods, but my camera's running out of juice because it's so cold. And I think I, I, you know, I don't need to beat it over the head. You get the idea of what I'm going for here. What are the opportunities? You know, there's Mollison, Bill Mollison, the person who coined permaculture as a term way back when said, you don't have a slug problem, you have a duck deficiency. And the idea being there is like, how do we turn problems into solutions? How do we work with what's being presented? And so you could maybe say you don't have an emerald ash borer problem. You have a lack of shade tolerant, diverse, highly productive understory shrubs and trees. A little less catchy than the duck one that he used, but you get what I'm getting at. So how do we move forward? The climate's changing like crazy quote-unquote invasives and pests and predators are coming in like crazy and blah, blah, blah. How do we work with this instead of fight it all the time? This year, somewhere on the order of, I believe it was 17 trillion cicadas are supposed to wake up in the spring and the mid-Atlantic will just get bathed in that. Is that an incredible problem or is that a chance for the most, the like most astronomical harvest of mineral and protein of 17 years. You know, there's a lot of ways that we can look at what's going on in this world. Anyway, that's my spiel. I'm sticking with it. Thanks. Let me know what you do with emerald ash borer situations or woolly adelgid on your hemlocks or, 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 and, and, and. Take care. <laughs>